Hello, I'm John David Ebert, and welcome to Class 9 in our lecture tour here uh, through the landscape of contemporary art, understanding contemporary art, which we're seeking to, to do here. Um, now, to recap briefly, what we had seen with the history of Western art was the movement from perspectival art, in which we had a single point of view created by a single observer with a perspectival space, and everything in that space subject to that one point of view, to with modernism, and that begins with the Impressionists, the collapse of perspectival space, into multiple spaces, multiple temporalities that begin to break free into worlds of their own. And then with modernist, modernist art as it cycles through with Picasso and Cubism and so forth, we began to shift out of the waking world, the, the world of what the Hindus would simply call waking consciousness, back into the dreaming world, the platonic world of the platonic ideas or hyperdimensional objects, if you want to call them that, that program for the physical world, that program for the world of waking consciousness. And this is the theoretical object, the portrait of Ambrose Villard, let's say. These are the theoretical objects which are purely thought about by the mind, but they are the programs. They act as the causal images that program for the physical world in an idealist sense. Two, with abstract expressionism then, with the drip paintings of Pollock and the mature paintings of Rothko, back into a deep metaphysical zone of almost analogous to the Hindu idea of deep dreamless sleep, where we move into the causal zones, not the zones of the platonic ideas, but the causal deep metaphysical vortices, the deep zones that generate even those platonic ideas, which then code for the waking consciousness in the world of naturalist art. So Western art has gone backward uh, from waking to dreaming to deep dreamless sleep, if we wanted to think of it that way through that stencil. But it ends up being highly theoretical, and with Pollock and Rothko, we're, we're really existing in a world uh, of a kind of metaphysical phase space. It's very abstract, uh, very difficult for some people to understand. But with pop art, um, what begins to happen now is a complete shift about the other way. Now, uh, Arthur Danto famously regarded pop art as the death of art, and it was the death of art because with Andy Warhol's Brillo boxes, which we'll get to next time, um, with something like that, uh, the, uh, Brillo, the Brillo box essentially faces the distinction between the banal object, the commonplace thing, and the art object. And collapsing and effacing that distinction, now we no longer have anything that's art on the one hand, and something that's not art on the other, because things that used to be considered not art can now be art. So there is no longer such a distinction between art and not art uh, with, with pop art. So now for Arthur Danto, that was the death of art, or at least the end of art. It isn't the end of art, it's just a different way of practicing art. And what is happening with the pop artists is they bring our attention to the world of, capital, of the capitalist consumer society now that is uh, configuring all around us in a landscape of icons. And one of the things that they're drawing our attention to, as we'll see here with a quick flyby through some of this pop art, um, is that um, the pop art landscape, the, the landscape of the consumer capitalist mentality is a landscape that has been configured for us by electric information overload. When you accelerate society to electronic speeds, what happens is that everything collapses in just as a light object does in Einsteinian uh, space-time, collapses into two dimensions, and you begin to get the creation of this world of icons. One icon after the next. Uh, all begin to flatten out and configure into a phase space surrounding us, and all of these two-dimensional icons, they can, e they can be celebrities, or celebrity avatars, or they can be brand names of corporations, or they can be ads themselves, whatever they are. They begin to surround us with this glowing, numinous world now that begins to replace the old signifiers of the old art. So what happens is that the semiotic vacancies that Mark Rothko had showed, showed us in his later art, had shown us, where he showed the fate of the deconstruction of the signifieds, the iconotypes, the Madonna, the crucifixion, those were deconstructed and they left semiotic vacancies behind and Rothko was picturing that for us. But now the pop artists in illuminating the contemporary landscape of consumer capitalists are showing us what icons, what signifiers have now come to replace the numinous glow of those ancient uh, transcendental signifiers of Christ and the Virgin Mary and so forth. Uh, as McLuhan said, um, anytime you take even advertising does this. It doesn't even have to be a work of art. Advertising does the same exact thing that the pop artists are mirroring and reflecting in their art. Anytime you take an object from consumer capitalist banality, a Brillo box off the shelf, and you put it in an ad, whether it's a television ad or an ad in a magazine, doesn't matter, you automatically confer upon that object a kind of fetish quality, a numinous glow about it, almost a religious aura. Uh, that makes it desirable. And also that religious aura, semi-pseudo-religious aura, 
uh, begins to show that these are the signifiers that are replacing, that are filling the semiotic vacancies now, that are replacing the world that has collapsed and been deconstructed with the death of the metaphysical age. So this is this is a grand art now of the post-metaphysical age, and this is the, the art that is being illuminated for us uh, by pop art. So now what I want to do is to do a quick flyby of a few pop artists here. This is Robert Rauschenberg's, this first image is Robert Rauschenberg's monogram from 1955, between 55 and 59. And what he has done here, one of the aspects um, about uh, when a culture reaches an end phase is that it creates a kind of metaphysical junkyard out of its signifiers. Um, the junkyard or the midden heap is the, the British term, but the junkyard is the realm where all of the signifiers of the previous age that built the civilization and informed it and constructed it have now been collapsed and deconstructed and they've fallen into this, this junkyard, this midden heap of disused cliches and archetypes and signifiers that now it is the job of the artist to go and raid. And Rauschenberg was an expert at this. He went to the junkyard of uh, the Western tradition and he began fishing out these signifiers. And what happens is the junkyard forms because old archetypes have been scrapped by new technologies that have come along, scrapped the archetypes, rendered them into cliches, and the artist who is a fisherman of forms goes and pulls these cliches out. And simply by rubbing one cliche up against another, you create new archetypes as works of art. That is precisely what Rauschenberg has done here with his famous, probably his most famous work of art, Monogram, where he's fished out uh, a rubber tire that becomes a signifier for the automobile industry and the entire industrial world that produced it. Here the goat has been fished out as the signifier for the old agrarian world of the farmer and the nomad and the herdsman. Uh, it could be read as an image of the industrial world rolling over that older world or a hybrid of two different signifiers that now create something strange and new. And he's put it on top of a kind of Kurt Schfitters like his own sort of neo Dadaist collage. And uh, the collage artists of the Dada, of the Dada tradition were also doing something similar. They were already putting collages together out of signifiers that were put together in a patchwork from these collapsed midden heaps. And Rauschenberg is doing essentially the same thing here. Um, here is uh, Rauschenberg's um, uh, painting uh, Retroactive from 1964 in which you can begin to get the sense in his art that the electronic umwelt of the televisual age is an age of signifier overload. It's an age now not of the absence of, of signifiers but of too many of them beaming at us from all directions at light speed and we're getting so many of them there's a constant bombardment of images. No matter which way the individual turns he is bombarded by signifiers on ads and commercials and logos and now at gas stations with electronic image screens. They're everywhere on the backs of your seat on an airplane. Um, we're constantly bombarded by the images and signifiers of capitalist uh, advertising. This is Jasper Johns' American uh, flag of 1954. And Johns here um, is simply taking the flag as a sign. And a sign, the thing about a sign, whether it's a stop sign or a flag or a stoplight, simply has one meaning in the realm of the Zuhandenheit flow of things, it only has one meaning. But if you take a sign and you aestheticize it by painting it, putting it into a, an aesthetic context, now you're putting it into a Vorhandenheit mode, just like uh, Duchamp did with his ready-mades, and you're conferring an aesthetic value on it. Now it's meant to be contemplated and a sort of signifier aura or a cloud of meanings now begins to assemble around the image. Johns has given the flag here. It's not just a photographic flag. He's He's put brush strokes on it. He's given it texture. It's no longer just a banal object. It's an aesthetic object as something to be contemplated. Uh, in this uh, painting of his, he does something similar with a, with a target. This is Target with Plaster Casts from 1955. And he's got a series of these plaster casts of various parts of the body running across something as simple and banal as a target. Now, the thing about technology, when you stand in front of a target, name a gun or a bow and an arrow, every technology fragments the body. Um, the gun is an extension of the hand, the bullets are extensions of the teeth, uh, and they're in line with the sense of sight, which is also fragmented. So technology fragments the body and breaks it up into pieces, gives it a kind of German zerisenheit or disassemblage of the body. Uh, but the job of art is to come along and to heal and confer wholeness on what technology has disrupted and fragmented. And that is essentially, I think, what Johns is doing here with this image of a target conferring these pieces of the body, uh, giving it a kind of synthetic unity or wholeness, almost like um, it's almost like the, the Lacanian sense of the disunified self before uh, the confrontation with the image in the mirror uh, that gives to the infant a sense of wholeness. Art is that mirror that confers wholeness on the individual after technology has broken it up. 
Uh, the same goes, I think, here to a certain degree with Jasper for Jasper Johns's painting here of Gray's Numbers, 1958, in which we see uh, the capitalist landscape is configured by numbers. Everywhere we turn, we're configured, we're confronted with numbers that are racing at the speed of light all around us. And here he's given these numbers tactile values. He's taken them out of time and put them into space and spatialized them so that now they have a kind of tactility. You really want to reach out and touch them. Uh, they've got a kind of braille quality to them. Uh, in that sense. And here is uh, Roy Lichtenstein's uh, 1964 As I Opened Fire. Um, Lichtenstein liked to take the comic book image and to scale it up, to blow it up. And really uh, one of the differences between art and consumer banal things is a matter of scale. If you blow something up to a large scale, as we'll see in a moment with Oldenburg, it becomes a work of art. And uh, Roy Lichtenstein was very much fascinated with blowing up comic books to the level of works of art as images to be contemplated. And he really liked, here you can sense the pointillist tactility of the comic book image that he really liked. He liked that pointillism that began in Impressionism with Seurat and continues all the way down with television. Here is Claus Oldenburg, uh, his three-way plug which gives us a sense of almost scaling us down to the level of Alice in Wonderland when she's taken the pill that has shrunken her down and she's completely surrounded with these giant things. In the electronic capitalist umwelt, we're surrounded by gigantified humans in the form of celebrities and superheroes from comics. We're surrounded by gigantified ads and building logos that are attained to the level of skyscrapers. Everywhere we look, we're surrounded with a culture of icons that has been gigantified around us and makes us feel small and dwarfed. Uh, this is Claus Oldenburg's uh, clothespin, 1976, which also has the same effect. It's no longer Michelangelo's David. Uh, it's something as banal as a clothespin. Anything that has been uh, shot around us in the form of one kind of advertising or another has now attained to the level of, of gigantification. Uh, and here's another Claus Oldenburg from uh, 2001. Um, and I think we'll end here with this image of uh, Jeff Koons, which gives us a sense of uh, Jeff Koons is in direct descent from Klaus Oldenburg. That he is uh, a direct offshoot of the kinds of kitsch and sentimentality, but also the cult of the celebrity that has opened up in the world of pop art. And so that gives us a quick flyby tour of pop art. And next we'll begin to look at some of the works of these artists in more uh, detail.